Hello. Uh, thanks for joining me at the end of the day. My name is Ryan Nienheis. I'm a product manager for the Amazon Kinesis team. Uh, with me, we have Vinayak Lahande, who is our customer at Autodesk, who's going to talk about uh, with me architecting for real-time insights with Amazon Kinesis. So the first part of the talk, I'm going to give an overview about what streaming data is and a couple of our, couple of our services that uh, customers use for real-time analytics, including Amazon Elasticsearch Service and Amazon Kinesis Data Analytics. And then uh, Vin is going to go into the Autodesk architecture for their unified logging platform and how they solve uh, monitoring their customer experience. So before I get, begin, though, um, who uses Amazon Elasticsearch Service? Great show of hands. Uh, who has used uh, one of the Amazon Kinesis services? Awesome. All right, great. So for some of you, uh, we'll, this will be the first part of the talk will be a little bit of an uh, uh, overview, so I'll try to make it quick. But let's get started. So first, uh, let's talk about what streaming data is. So streaming data is data that is generated uh, at high volume, continuously and then typically captured and processed in an ordered and incremental manner with low latency. So let's unpack that a little bit. So when we talk about streaming data being generated continuously, most data is generated continuously, but these are things from like mobile devices, IoT sensors, application logs. The key that makes it streaming is if you capture it and continuously capture it and continuously process it. For low latency, for uh, at least for Kinesis customers, when we talk about low latency, the, this typically means processing data in approximately one second to do something with it. And that could be sending it to an Elasticsearch cluster or a database or a monitoring tool like CloudWatch. Typically, customers, their end-to-end -end pipelines are on the order of a couple seconds. But we do have like a subset of our customers that process and react to the data sub-second or even sub-200, 300 milliseconds. So why do customers adopt streaming data technologies? The, the primary reason is they want to get more timely insights. And the simple analogy I have for this is customers want to know uh, a business report generated now is more valuable than a business report generated 60 days ago. Additionally, if you can detect and react to a problem with your customer experience immediately, that's much more valuable than finding out after the fact that a customer left your website, or your customer had a poor customer experience, or maybe they couldn't find exactly what they were looking for on your mobile app. So Amazon Kinesis is a set of services that make it easy to work with streaming data on AWS. The focus of the talk is going to be on our three data services. Uh, the first service is Amazon Kinesis Data Streams. It enables you to capture and process streaming data in real time. Secondly, Kinesis Data Firehose allows you to capture and then deliver data in real time. So Kinesis Data Firehose is primarily about data movement from point A to point B. And it, customers typically use it where they're doing processing at the destination. So for example, Firehose delivers to Amazon Elasticsearch Service. The bulk of the processing is done in Elasticsearch in that case. For customers that do want to process data as it's moving, we have another service called Kinesis Data Analytics. And this allows you to analyze the streaming data in real time with either SQL or Java code. So when customers use Amazon Kinesis data streams, they create a stream. They have a set of producers that write to that stream and a set of consumers that read from the stream and then do something with it. Right, back to the continuous nature, both the producers and the consumers are acting continuously. When you write data to a Kinesis data stream or even a Kinesis data firehose, there's a variety of options that are provided to you. By far, the most popular are the AWS SDKs. Uh, however, there's a lot of other options. Uh, the, Vin is going to talk a little bit about the Kinesis agent, which will tail a log file to send it to Kinesis data services. We have another library called the Kinesis producer library, which is specifically designed for high throughput data producers. Think like a giant application server. We also have managed solutions for forwarding data to Kinesis, things like CloudWatch logs, AWS IoT, and a number of other services. But there's a lot of different ways to get into data Kinesis after it's there. 
uh, you have a lot of options to process it. But let's first walk through a little bit what happens after we data is ingested into Kinesis data stream. So Kinesis will durably store the data after it receives it from you across three availability zones. It essentially hits three disks. Uh, data is stored in an ordered fashion such that when you attach a consumer to a stream, that consumer always reads the data in the same order that it, it was persisted. So this is a, one of the primary differences between a stream and a queue uh, in the sense that the order is always maintained. And in addition to that, you can attach multiple consumers that are reading from different parts of the stream. So you might have, for example, an AWS Lambda function that is processing the data at the tip of the stream and a Kinesis data analytics application that's consuming maybe an hour behind. Uh, these are independently managed uh, consumers that uh, they're processing and they're, where they're processing from is tracked independently from the stream. So I mentioned Kinesis Data Firehose is primarily about delivery. Uh, ingest mechanisms are very similar to Kinesis data streams. So we have uh, several managed options as well as you can write with the agent or the AWS SDKs. We have an uh, Apache Kafka connector that will forward data from Kafka to a Kinesis data firehose. And then it'll deliver the data to f uh, the four supported destinations. So Amazon S3, Amazon Redshift, Amazon Elasticsearch Service, and Splunk. Along the way, you can do very little processing from just configuring how large of a file that you want in S3 or how frequently you want to write data to S3 to much more complex processing. So Firehose will actually convert uh, JSON data to Parquet format, which is a columnar data format prior to delivery to S3. You can run ETL scripts via AWS Lambda, perform compression, and much more. So you'll see over time the Kinesis team will gradually add more and more processing capabilities to Kinesis data firehose. However, for all most intensive purposes, firehose is used as streaming ETL. The goal is to get the data to the destination. Amazon Elasticsearch, uh, sorry, Elasticsearch with a Kanbana is, is a very common tool for doing uh, search and analytics in real time, building operational and business dashboards. Vin is going to go through how Autodesk uses it to build some of their, what they call a single pane of glass. Amazon Elasticsearch Service combines Elasticsearch and Kibana and offers it in a fully managed service that makes it easy to create, deploy, and scale Elasticsearch clusters. When you work with Elasticsearch, you create a cluster. That cluster does everything from indexing, uh, exposes uh, simple to advanced analytics, analytical tools to you. The other thing Amazon Elasticsearch Service does is it's well integrated with the AWS ecosystem. So for example, Amazon Kinesis Data Firehose is one of the services that Elasticsearch, Amazon Elasticsearch Service is integrated with. Kinesis Data Firehose will send data to Elasticsearch. If there's ever an issue with the delivery or a problem, maybe you have an IAM role misconfigured or something along those lines, we'll fail over to S3 so that you can backfill data. If there's an issue with any of your transformations, so for example, if you're using AWS Lambda to perform that script along the way, if you have an issue with the transformation, again, deliver it to S3 to make sure that you don't lose any data. And that's the key with uh, the majority of Kinesis services is that we make sure that we always, any data that you send to us, that you actually get it, process it, and are able to act upon it in real time. So one of the final services I want to cover, and we'll go a little bit deeper into uh, it with a couple more slides, is uh, Amazon Kinesis Data Analytics, which allows you to continuously process data from streaming data sources like Kinesis Data Firehose and Kinesis Data Streams. The primary reason to use Kinesis Data Analytics versus just using Firehose and performing your analytics, for example, in Elasticsearch, is if you would like to get a little bit more speed or you want to do some pre-processing or you want to react to data in real time. So the two most popular use cases we see with Kinesis Data Analytics are uh, pre-aggregations and analytics for ahead of operational monitoring. So computing like a rolling sum or um, uh, filtering data prior to sending it to say CloudWatch or Amazon Elasticsearch or Sumo Logic or Splunk uh, with the goal of basically being reducing the data set prior to sending it and getting some more flexibility with what you do with the data. The second core biggest use case we see with Kinesis Data Analytics is for business analytics, which is not really the focus too much of this talk, but customers will perform aggregations to produce like real-time dashboards for their customers, 
as well as pre-aggregations in front of things like uh, Amazon Redshift or Amazon Aurora. Again, uh, back to the beginning part of the slide, the goal is to get more timely insights. So customers decide upon this approach both for flexibility, but also so after they perform those aggregations, they end up with a uh, table that a user can query sub-minute or sub-two minutes instead of sending a bunch of raw data to one table to performing a bunch of ETL steps, which might take minutes or even hours. So Amazon Kinesis Data Analytics offers two languages, both Java and SQL-based applications. The focus that I'm going to cover on the next two couple of slides are SQL and how you write SQL over streaming data. So the most common aggregations are things like sum and min max. So imagine counting the number of errors, um, 500s on web access logs or something along those lines. But because data is continuous, you need some way to bound your processing. And we do that with windows. So windows allow you to determine when to start processing and when to produce a result. And there's different types of windows that we support. So Kinesis Data Analytics supports sliding, tumbling, and staggering windows. The simplest one to describe is tumbling. And you can think of it as like producing a periodic report, just really, really fast, at the end of the window. So perhaps you have a five-minute tumbling window, as you can see from T0 to T5, and you're performing a count. What that will do is at the end of that five-minute window, we'll produce a two. And we'll do so based off of whatever keys you put in, say, a group by statement. So uh, you're grouping by, say, uh, an, a an API, specific API call or a specific operation. We'll produce counts by that, partitioned in that manner. Sliding windows are more popular for operational use cases because they produce results uh, for every single event uh, flowing through the stream. It's sort of a rolling or a sliding count. So whereas tumbling windows, there's kind of a reduced step. We count these events, and there's a two that we produce. Sliding windows will produce an event for every single event that you process. So a rolling count will look like, in this particular case, there'll be one, two, and if we kept on going, it would be three, four, and then perhaps an event drops out of the window and it goes back to three. Sliding windows are typically used for operational monitoring use cases or when customers want to react as fast as possible to the stream. The final is a stagger window, which I'll cover on the next slide. This is what a stagger window looks like when you write a SQL query. So when you work with Kinesis Data Analytics, we need some mechanism for you to tell us that to operate continuously. You keep on hearing me say that word. That mechanism is a pump. So what you'll do is you create a pump that reads from one in-application stream and writes to another in-application stream, almost building a data flow within your application. This simple query produces a result over a one-minute stagger window. Stagger windows are typically used when you have inconsistencies in uh, your data that you want um, to accommodate for. And when I say inconsistencies, when you produce uh, analytics in real time, uh, very often data arrives late or out of order. Uh, when I say late, it means we have produced a result, for example, in a tumbling window, and an event that should have been included in that result, perhaps it got stuck on a disk somewhere, or you had a node failover, and it arrives after we computed the computation. So what stagger windows allow you to do is that uh, you define an aggregation period, which is that last line right there. And that aggregation period is different than what you perform the aggregation on. So for example, if you know that most of your data will arrive within two minutes, but you want to aggregate data in 30-second windows, this allows you to delay the result a little bit so that you only produce one result with all the data, as opposed to multiple results with the late data. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Vin, who's going to talk about Autodesk's unified log, log platform. Thanks, Ryan. Hi there. Uh, my name is Vinayak Lokhande. I'm principal DevOps engineer at Autodesk. I would like to talk about Autodesk Unified Log Platform, or what we call it as instrumentation service. This is the agenda for my part of presentation here. First, we'll go over why instrumentation service, design principles around it, its architecture, how we came up with a self-service mechanism, best practices around it, and finally, the summary. 
Before we go into the details, a brief overview about Autodesk. Autodesk gives you the power to make anything. If you have ever driven a high-performance car, admired a, sky, a towering skyscraper, used a smartphone, or watched a great film, chances are that you have experienced what millions of customers are doing with Autodesk softwares. We have 200 plus million Autodesk customers worldwide with 680 million students and educators with free access to Autodesk software. So at the, at the core of Autodesk Cloud Platform is Autodesk Forge Platform. Forge is a connected developer platform that powers the future of making things. So let's take a look at a typical customer workflow here. Here, the customer is uploading a design model. This model is going to traverse through various interconnected Autodesk Forge services. In the end, the customer is going to get back the rendered model. So the customer experience really matters here. If one of the service is having issue, it is going to directly affect the customer's experience. The customer can reach to Autodesk support and say, hey, you know what? There is some issue with your cloud services. I cannot see my model. He can be polite, or he can be a little bit angry and say, why on the earth I cannot see my model here? With this, I would like to put in this saying here, that is, failures in today's complex, distributed, and interconnected systems are not exception. In fact, they are normal cases. They are not predictable, and they are not avoidable. With this in mind, I would like to introduce you to uh, why we came up with instrumentation service. So we came up with instrumentation service to be able to trace transactions across the interconnected forge services, to be able to detect problems real time, thus reducing the MTTD and notifying upon them, provide forensics, log analysis capabilities, last but not the least, provide analytics, derive insights to derive features and resiliency. To summarize, we wanted to have a consistent way to collect and measure matrix of our Forge services. So now we know why we came up with instrumentation service. Let's go over some of the design principles we took into consideration while building this service. First and foremost, we wanted to have well-defined separation of concern. Then we wanted to minimize the maintenance cost. Obviously, the system should be fault tolerant, easy to use, highly scalable, and extensible. Keeping these design principles in mind, let's move on to unified logging. So unified logging, uh, we also refer to it by UL. We came up with this to solve this problem. Essentially, Forge is nothing but interconnected services together. All of these services were logging in different formats. That's the problem we had. Having log data in different format gives you these challenges, which is cross service tracing is almost impossible. Forensics, monitoring, and analytics on this log data is pretty difficult. And deriving SLO and SLI matrix is close to impossible. The solution was we came up with unified logging via standardized log data model. In this, what we did is we essentially annotated log records with distribu distributed tracing states. This was based on open tracing uh, specification. You can find that on opentracing.io. And we essentially developed SDKs supporting multiple languages, such as Golang, Java, Python, Node.js, so forth, so on. This is a sample UL log record here. As you can see, it's essentially a JSON record. And uh, I would like to highlight a couple of important fields here, which I'm going to refer back down the line in the presentation. Uh, the third field down the line is UL operation, which signifies the name of the operation the service is performing. It can be an API name. Uh, the, the next line below that is UL span duration here. 
this is nothing but how much time it took for the service to perform this operation. With the, these designs principle in mind, let's move on to the architecture of service. To begin with, what we have uh, are the data producers or the client services here. We have an EC2 uh, uh, instance on which we have a service which is using the UL SDK, and it is going to generate the UL logs. Then we have ECS containers and Lambda functions. Again, both of these are generating UL logs using UL SDK. The logs from the ECS containers and the Lambda function flow into CloudWatch logs. At the same time, the logs from the ECS instance and the CloudWatch logs are sent to what we call it as per service infrastructure here. Now, uh, on the EC, EC2 instance, we are using the Kinesis agent to forward the logs. Uh, for the in, in case of CloudWatch logs, we are using the CloudWatch subscription to send these logs to uh, Kinesis Data Firehose. The thing to note here is we have per service infrastructure. This per service infrastructure is essentially for each of the data producer here or each of the client service here. And I'm, I'm going to walk over this little bit in more detail later on. Now, once these UL logs land uh, into Kinesis Data Firehose, they are essentially sent to Amazon Elasticsearch service. Here, these logs, uh, we retain these logs for uh, five days. At the same time, these logs are also returned to the secondary destination. In this case, it is a S3 bucket. So what we do here is we do a SNS fan out and we trigger two lambdas. The first lambda on the top there is the X-ray lambda. This X-ray lambda will essentially open up that S3 object because it's a UL log data and it's annotated with distributed tracing. This lambda can then uh, generate X-ray traces, and we are essentially storing these uh, traces in AWS X-ray. The second lambda here essentially massages this data and stores it into central S3 bucket. This central S3 bucket uh, is different than the buffer S3 bucket in terms of retention period here. We are essentially storing data up to 90 days in central S3 bucket here. And then what you can do is you can use AWS Athena service to perform log analysis and search on this data. So as the data is flowing into Kinesis Data Firehose, we have Kinesis Data Analytics, which is going to continuously read upon this data. As Ryan mentioned, uh, Kinesis Data Analysi uh, Analytics is a SQL processor. So you can do something like this. Kinesis Data Analytics can say, hey, give me last 60 seconds worth of data, and on a given field, I want to perform certain aggregations. I would like to refer back to the UL operation and UL span duration. You can essentially say, all right, I want aggregations to be performed for a given UL operation by the span duration. Now, this, these, this aggregated result is what is fed into CloudWatch matrix, and this is what we call it as the SLO SLI matrix for a given service. At the same time, we have another rich set of matrix stored in CloudWatch matrix, which is uh, nothing but the infrastructure matrix. As all of these are AWS managed services, you have rich set of matrix coming from EC2 instance, containers, Lambda functions, even if, if let's say ALBs are fronting these services or API gateways are fronting these services, you have all of that matrix present in CloudWatch matrix. We then pull these set of matrix into Grafana, and that's what we call it as single pane of glass or SPOG. So to recap, what do we get out of this architecture? First and foremost, we get uh, ability to have transaction traces across connected services. Second, we have ability to perform five uh, log search and analysis on five days plus worth of data. Then we have uh, uh, um, uh, elastic search service, sorry, um, my bad. We can use AWS uh, uh, Athena service to uh, uh, perform five plus days of log search and analysis here. Then we have elastic search service 
in which the data is retained here for five days, and you can essentially search upon on that data. Then we have Kinesis Data Analytics. This is where we get real-time analytics to feed to CloudWatch and single pane of glass. And last but not the least, we are storing all of this matrix in CloudWatch matrix, and you can essentially alert real-time on the matrix. So this is the architecture uh, we came up with. One of the things to note here is uh, this part of the architecture, wherein we have per-service in infrastructure. Now, we wanted to have per-service uh, infrastructure to achieve separation of concern to make the, the whole platform resilient. With this came another challenge here, that is how are we going to have this per-service infrastructure created for 30 plus services? We had more than 30 plus services in Autodesk and we wanted to create this uh, infrastructure for all of them. So that's where we came up with this solution here. Let's just focus only on the uh, application specific infrastructure here, which looks something like this. So at Autodesk, we use ServiceNow, and this is the mechanism uh, which we came up with. The SME of the service will submit an onboarding request via Snow. Once it is approved, it will trigger a Jenkins job. This Jenkins job is going to do a couple of things. First and foremost, it is going to trigger a bunch of Terraform scripts, and that's what will set up the application-specific infrastructure here. Second, what it does is, it creates a GitHub repo specific for that application. This GitHub repo consists of config.yaml. I'm going to walk uh, into detail what is this config.yaml. Now this git, git repo is hooked up to another Jenkins job, and this Jenkins job has access to all the components related to that service. So think of it, the second job can essentially access Firehose, Kinesis Data Analytics, and the CloudWatch Lambda, which is specific to the, the service there. At the same time, what we do is we provide the SME access to that GitHub repo. Now, going back to this config.yaml, as the SME has access to this config.yaml, he essentially indirectly has access to all, the, all of the component related to his service here. So this is what the config.yaml looks like. This is just a part of it, wherein uh, I'm talking about uh, what, what you can see here on the screen is related to Kinesis Data Analytics here. Now, as uh, Ryan mentioned, Kinesis Data Analytics uh, is SQL processor. Essentially, you have to write down SQL queries. Now, writing these SQL queries uh, can be a little bit complex, and what we did is we wanted to abstract that complexity from the user. We wanted to make it easy for the user. So we came up with predefined templates. The, the template which you can see on the screen essentially calculates various percentiles, count of status codes for a given service. And as you can see here, what you have to do is you have to essentially specify which field in the schema relates or uh, translates into uh, the UL operation, and which field essentially translates to the duration. And then you have to just tell the name of the operations. So this is what is one part of the config.yaml. User is essentially going to choose one of the predefined template, and then he essentially commits to the Git repo. That is what is going to trigger the second Jenkins job, uh, which I just went over, and this Jenkins' job is essentially going to convert this template into a full-fledged Kinesis SQL query. And since this Jenkins' job has access to the application's infrastructure, this full-fledged SQL query is then injected into the Kinesis data analytics. So th that's how we uh, achieved uh, the ease of use uh, for, uh, for Kinesis data analytics using the config.yaml. Now I'm going to talk about some of the other example use cases uh, of instrumentation service. One of the things uh, which instrumentation service provides is Elasticsearch service, and with Elasticsearch service comes Kibana. At Autodesk, Kibana or Elasticsearch service is used widely. 
We have uh, all sort of dashboards uh, created uh, for various services here. This is an uh, example of X-ray traces. This is for one of our service there. So each circle here represents a given uh, operation or a given API call for the service. The green uh, here means like if the, the, this call was doing OK or good, and the yellow here represents warning and red error, so forth, so on. This is an example of SPOG, or what we call it as single pane of glass. Here you can see the first row essentially uh, depicts the overall status for a given service. We are essentially pulling up this matrix from the CloudWatch matrix of ALB. You can put in anything there, maybe API Gateway or whatever your service uh, is using there. The second two rows there are essentially for um, uh, the key APIs, or they are essentially the SLO, SLI matrix for your service. These are coming real time from the Kinesis data analytics using the SQL queries. Continuation of SPOG, uh, this particular service here uses uh, Aurora, and you can see uh, we uh, were able to plot rich set of matrix for AWS Aurora. Now, if you combine these two graphs, you can think of you have a single pane of glass wherein the first row is showing you the overall status of the service, then you have the SLO, SLI matrix for each key API of your service, and then finally you have the infrastructure matrix. If there is anything wrong with your service, that's the place you will go and see. If, if my ALB is having issue, if yes, which API is having issue, if yes, which infrastructure component is having issue. With this, I would like to move on to lessons learned or some of the best practices around uh, the various components of this architecture. So we did extensive amount of performance testing. And it was not just a single iteration that we perfect, uh, per did, got a perfect architecture. We had to try this out multiple times. And for each iteration, we did performance testing essentially to identify and test solution limits. So we are using AWS managed services here. For each of the AWS managed service, there are limits. You have to essentially know this limit, you have to test those limits. And for doing so, you have to do performance testing. We essentially uh, did this kind of performance testing wherein we uh, had 30 data producers these 30 data producers were creating close to three terabyte of data per day. And uh, this was resulting into 700 shards, active shards in Elasticsearch cluster, and close to 200 uh, queries per second. So uh, the, 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 I would like to stress upon uh, the last part here. The 200 queries per second is uh, what, uh, what we did uh, to, to introduce the search load on the Elasticsearch cluster. With this, what we did was we were able to achieve close to 80% CPU utilization on Elasticsearch cluster and close to 55% uh, JV memory pressure on Elasticsearch cluster. And we ran it for close to a week or so. Some more lessons learned around uh, Elasticsearch service. Well, uh, this... Uh, Cloud uh, Elasticsearch service, there is this set of matrix. Uh, it has rich set of matrix by default. In fact, this point is no longer valid because uh, Elasticsearch recently released a new version wherein they have added this matrix. Previous to uh, this version, what we did was we created our own Lambda function, which would get per node CPU, uh, per node JVM heap, underscore bulk queue size, and per index field count. But to my knowledge, uh, all of this is now by default available in Elasticsearch CloudWatch Matrix. So if we recall the architecture, the Elasticsearch service is your crown jewel. Why? Because it is shared across all the services there. And you need to protect your crown jewel here. So one of the, the, the things which, uh, which we ran into, one of the issues which we ran into was per index field limit. There is a default uh, a field limit of 1,000 per index on Elasticsearch service. 
so uh, essentially you should be monitoring this and if you are reaching any closer to 700 or 800, you should be taking action of either bumping it up or you should take action of restricting these number of fields. And for that, you'll have to work with the application team to restrict the number of fields they are sending. So again, Elasticsearch service, uh, one of the, uh, the thing uh, there is you should be sizing it correctly, right? How do you size it? There is a great article written by John Handler uh, around t-shirt sizing of Elasticsearch cluster. And essentially, what you have to do is you have to find out the input load to your Elasticsearch service, which will translate into number of active shards. And then there is a shards to index to CPU ratio, which, you, which is something like for each shard, you need one CPU. Based on this, you can then size your Elasticsearch cluster, choose which instance type you're looking for, and how many of those instances you need. The last two point here is, uh, again, make sure that your Elasticsearch cluster, the CPU utilization and the JVM memory pressure always remain below 75%. Moving on to lesson learned uh, re related to Kinesis data firehose. So if we, if we take a closer look at the firehose architecture, its architecture looks something like this. We have Lambda buffer at the front, then we have the transformation Lambda, and then we have Elasticsearch buffer. So the first point here is you can use the transformation Lambda. As the name suggests, it's a transformation Lambda. But you can use this transformation Lambda as a rate limiting mechanism. And the way to do that is for this transformation Lambda, what we did is we used the concurrency because you can set the, the, the number of concurrent execution for this lambda. If you tweak the lambda buffer and you set, set this uh, concurrent execution correctly, you are essentially going to rate limit what is the output to the ES buffer. Using this, you, know, you are essentially protecting your crown gel, which is your Elasticsearch cluster here. Again, this transformation lambda, while it is just it is doing transformation, you can also filter out garbage data. If a service is sending data which is not as per the schema uh, which we have agreed upon, then you can essentially discard that data. Next one there is uh, setting up firehose per data producer. So one of the design principle for instrumentation service was separation of concern. And um, again, I would like to go back uh, to the fact that this firehose is writing to Elasticsearch. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to have separation of concern at each level. Think of it, we have uh, more than 30 data producers. If a given data producer starts writing, uh, let's say, uh, one TB of data, right? And the other data producer is just merely writing one GB of data, one GB of data per uh, per hour or so. What if we wouldn't have segregated the firehose, one producer will affect the other producer, not only at the firehose level, but even at the Elasticsearch level. By doing this, what we essentially did is we created indexes per data producer, even at the Elasticsearch level. This way, we were able to mitigate the problem of thousand field limit because we have separate index for separate services. It means each service is going to get thousand fields limit. At the same time, we, uh, we are segregating uh, the fire hoses so that these services don't step on each other. The next point here is around buffers. So as I mentioned, we are using AWS managed services here. These services will have different limits, different configuration parameters. There are certain buffers which uh, you should be aware of. We are using a Kinesis agent. There are a fixed set of buffers which are well defined in the documentation. You should pay attention to these buffers because tweaking this buffer is what is going to tell you how fast the data is sent from the client to uh, the firehose and so forth and so on. At the same time, the AWS Lambda buffer is also pretty important here. I briefly mentioned about how you can use this Lambda buffer 
along with the concurrent execution of the transformation lambda to achieve rate limiting. The last buffer here to note is the elastic surge buffer here. So this elastic surge buffer is, uh, is pretty important. This essentially will regulate how often the fire hose is writing to your elastic surge cluster here. If this buffer, if I recall correctly, the setting is from one to 300 MB. And uh, depending on what you set it up to, uh, let's say if you have set it too low, what will happen is the fire hose is going to make underscore bulk requests often to Elasticsearch. Now there is a default limit of 200 uh, bulk cube uh, length, right? Now that way you are going to get throttle at Elasticsearch level. If you set it too high, it means the data will be returned to Elasticsearch service less often. It means you're going to get huge latency when the data is produced at the service level and when it is uh, seen in the Elasticsearch service side. So depending on your service or depending on your data producers, you have to essentially uh, choose the buffers correctly. So these are some of uh, the lessons learned around Kinesis data analytics. Kinesis data analytics is essentially reading continuous stream of data from Firehose. One of the important parameter there is milliseconds behind latest. This is essentially how much the Kinesis data analytics is lagging from the Firehose. Now, you should be monitoring this uh, pretty closely. If it is uh, going any, any way above few seconds or so, there, there is again good amount of documentation on that. But if it is breaching certain limit, you should be notified upon that. And you have to either restart the Kinesis data analytics stream or you have to uh, bump it up, bump up the capacity of the Kinesis data analytics stream. The second one we uh, went over this, which is Kinesis data stream, uh, data analytics is using SQL. While this SQL is the standard SQL format, but uh, it can get complex if you're performing percentiles and other operations. So what, we, what you want to do is, you want to abstract the complexity of writing these SQLs using the templates. Config.yaml, uh, which I went over, is one of the way of doing that. Last but not the least, you should be sizing your Kinesis data app correctly. Again, uh, there, uh, there is, you know, you can find in the documentation, if your app is sending close to four MB per second, you need one stream. If you're sending more than that, you maybe probably you'll need two streams. So you, depending on how much data your service is going to send, you should be uh, sizing your KDA app correctly. All of this is possible because we are sharding at each level. Each app has its own Kinesis data analytics. So if you know how much the given app is going to send, you can size it up correctly. With this, I would like to summarize with the design principles we started with. And let's see how we did on all of them. Separation of concerns. Essentially, we wanted to have sharding at each layer. We wanted to have sharding at Firehose level. We wanted to have sharding at the elastic search layer because we wanted to uh, make sure that none of the service will step on each other. And we achieved that by segregating or sharding uh, at Firehose and at elastic search level. At elastic search level, again, we used separate indexes for each of the services. Second, ease to use. We wanted uh, the consumers uh, to be easily be able to tweak their service uh, specific infrastructure. We achieved that using the onboarding mechanism or the self-service mechanism of config.yaml. Then we wanted the system to be fault tolerant system and we got, achieved it using the rate limiting mechanism and the sharding uh, again helped there. Obviously we wanted to minimize the maintenance cost and have the system to be highly scalable and extensible. All of this, we got it just by being on AWS Managed Services. Thank you very much. With this, I would like to open up for any questions. Correct. Correct. 
Okay, so I would like to repeat the question here. Uh, the question was, uh, in, the, in the lessons learned uh, of the performance testing, we, I mentioned that uh, we were sending three terabyte of data. Was it from one producer or across the 30 producers? The answer is, we, it was split across the entire set, the 30 terabyte, because what we did is we sized the elastic search cluster there, uh, which uh, that it should be able to handle three terabyte of data. And th we then moved backwards and we said, okay, we are going to try with 30 different uh, apps because we wanted to test out how many fire hoses can write concurrently to the elastic search cluster. So that's why we just went up with 30 different services. That is correct. All right, uh, so the question here is, uh, we have per-service fire hose. These per-service fire hoses are writing to Elasticsearch service, which, in which we are, going, we are having uh, index for each of the service. So how are the downstream uh, services or the consumers of these uh, services using Elasticsearch, right? I mean, if they, have to, uh, they, if, if they have to query upon multiple indexes, how are they doing? So what we did is, uh, we named this index as something like UL-service1. The second one was UL-service2, and so forth, so on, right? And, and these indexes, uh, when you create the pattern, we created UL-service1-star, so forth, so on. Now, a person can go ahead and only query upon a given index, which matches that pattern, or he can specify, all right, I want to uh, query across the multiple patterns there. Sure. So uh, we started working on this yes. uh, almost an year back, and there was a team of close to... Uh, then repeat the question. Oh, sorry. The question was how much time uh, it took to come up with this, this service and how many engineers were working on it. So we started working on this almost an year back, and there, were, uh, there was a, a small team of almost around, uh, if I recall, two or three engineers. That's it. And... Um, what we essentially did is we started with automation. We, we said, okay, we want to segregate this, and we started with Terraform scripts to make it simple. And then that's when we started fitting in the, the self-service mechanism and so forth, so on. Sorry, you had a question? Um, so the question was, um, was Elasticsearch service running in VPC or outside of VPC? Right. Uh, you know, I don't remember the documentation here, but uh, if I recall correctly, Firehose cannot write to Kinesis, uh, sorry, Elasticsearch service running in a VPC. And so the answer to your question is yes, Elasticsearch service was ru not running in VPC in this case. The question is, what are the next steps around the architecture? So now we have a well-defined architecture and a well-defined well self-service mechanism here. Uh, we have ran into issues around scalability of some of the components there, and we are looking uh, towards solving those. Um, you know, one of the things which I, I, I did not mention about, uh, which we are achieving from this architecture is, we have per service firehose, which is writing to per service index, right? This gives us flexibility in case you want to move a given index out of one elastic search cluster to another. Let's say a service uh, starts writing huge amount of data, and that elastic search cluster is not able to uh, hold it up, right? You have scaled it up, but you, there is only this much you can do with it. What we can essentially do is we can start, we can move this index to a, a, its own elastic search service 
and uh, uh, essentially this way we can achieve sharding at the elastic search level so we wanted to do things more things like this because as the adoption of this platform grows in autodesk there will be challenges with respect to scaling okay thank you all very much for attending hope you all have fun at the replay party and have a good rest of your conference please fill up the session survey <laughs> <laughs>